Welcome to July Set News. My name is Rob. And today, just like the thumbnail and title suggests, there really are no more excuses for getting into Bitcoin. I mean, we've heard everything from the ESG compliant to the illicit activity to it just takes too much energy. And really, it's all going to be debunked. So we're going to talk about that. And also, we're going to take a look at two titans, and they have conflicting views as to when to invest into crypto and digital assets. So the first things first, this is an article that broke today, and it talks about how U.S. is the first nuclear-powered Bitcoin mining center to open in Q1. And it states the U.S. will open its first nuclear-powered data center, offering Bitcoin mining in the first quarter of the year. Data center, and it's going to be a data center, so there may be other things in there, but it's expected to start hosting nuclear-powered Bitcoin mining, the first ones, and cloud computing services in the first quarter, the first such service in the U.S. In August 2021, Talon Energy partnered with U.S.-based Bitcoin mining firm Terra Wolf to develop the Nautilus crypto mine, a zero-carbon Bitcoin mining facility on Kimo's data campus. And what this really comes down to is ESG compliance. I personally think it's just nonsense, but I mean, there's different companies that will give that lame excuse, so whatever. So there was a report from the Center for ESG and Sustainability provides a new analysis suggesting that nuclear power does a remarkable job when measured by ESG standards and deserves increased support from the financial community. And of course, you can take a look at that here, the Center for ESG and Sustainability. So when I take a look at that, there's a couple of things. First of all, if we can just agree that this is an ESG compliant, that means that these companies, like the ones that's like, you know, Shuckster Kevin O'Leary talks about is like, well, there's a big ESG compliant issue. Well, if you're going to use nuclear power and you get away from fossil fuels, that will alleviate that argument. And then on top of that, you're going to see hear some people go, well, what about nuclear power because of nuclear waste and all that stuff? That's going to be awful, but not so fast. There's a couple of videos from Kyle Hill, and he's an engineer, and he just debunked all that information because it's just so old. So I'm going to link this video in the description. It's about 18 minutes, and it really goes over uh, in a concise way why that's just a pretty much a ridiculous argument. And then also, if we're going to take a look at ESG compliance and the different problems that have, there was another piece from, uh, this is Daniel Batten, Climate Tech VC, ESG analyst. And he says, look, environmentally, Bitcoin has a positive negative ratio of 31 to 1. This means Bitcoin is probably the most important ESG technology. Here's the summary. And he gives it like this, but here's how it all breaks down. He says, firstly, we're no outlier. Out of five peers, fund managers of Climate Tech, four reached a similar view to our own and five hadn't made a company-wide opinion yet. And he states, the Washington Office of Science and Technology Policy affirmed this type of mining, which was, this was in uh, September 2022, crypto mining operations that captured vented methane, which is apparently bad for the environment. Not apparently, it is. We'll just say it is. To produce electricity can yield positive results for the climate. So what they're doing is they're capturing this methane that's being given off. They're powering the Bitcoin miners. And we're using something that would otherwise damage the environment. So win, win, win. So how they reached the view, and they, they gave it a, just a little breakdown, but here's the 21 ways it does. I'll link this in the description so you can uh, view it. Here's the positive. It's the first off-grid customer for renewable operators, number one demand response for tech. And of course, you can see that in the Texas miners, uh, places like Riot, what they do is they say, look, we want to mine Bitcoin. If we're going to do that, we will take off the, the excess power. If you're having a, a different uh, strand in the grid, we will turn off all of our Bitcoin miners and push that back to the grid so people can use it. So again, win, win, win. Retired gas peaker plants, gas peaker plants, peak load management, voltage management, so on and so forth. And the, the methane reduction and of course the macro. And then there are some negatives, can't get away from it. Ne network emission levels, e-waste, open up previous fossil fuel sites for people who aren't using these renewable energy sources. And uh, of course, nuclear power is talking about grid load dumping. And of course, the big one, noise pollution. So that again is just one of those components. Like I just, as we move away from these things, the narrative gets weaker and weaker. And on top of that, the other big one that I always hear about is this, illicit activity. There was a report, and this is from Michael Morrill. We talked about this many times in the show. He is the uh, former uh, director of intelligence at the CIA. And this is what he came up with. He goes, look, here was my conclusion. There was two. The broad generaliz generalizations about the use of Bitcoin in illicit finance are significantly overstated. The blockchain ledger on which Bitcoin transactions are recorded is an underutilized forensic tool that can be used more widely by law enforcement and the intelligence community 
to identify and disrupt illicit activities. But simply, blockchain analysis is a highly effective tool, blah, blah, blah. So again, this is one of the reasons why you've seen the Department of Justice come out. They say, you know, we're cracking down these places because everything's on an open ledger. I got to tell you, if I was in the cartel, and I'm not anymore, but if I was, I would definitely just want to use the U.S. dollar because it's way less uh, difficult to track. I mean, it's just it's just not. But if we're going to do everything on an open ledger, again, another one of those narratives to fall. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comments section. Let's move on to our next piece. Kind of some goodish, baddish news, Celsius. So they want approval for customer withdrawals of the Flare token airdrop. That's great. U.S. Bankruptcy Court authorized eligible XRP holders to receive the Flare tokens do under a prior agreement. Now, before I go on, I know people in the XR, XRP Army are going to say, well, how do I do this? How do I do this? How do I do this? This is just a report that came out, information. So when I find out something, I'll let you know. This was signed by Judge Martin Glenn, U.S. Bankruptcy Court, Southern District of New York, authorizes Celsius to return funds transferred to the platform. That sounds good. After the company filed for bankruptcy on July 14th. I don't know who was transferring funds to Celsius after July 14th. Maybe people who had collateralized loans. But if you do that after July 14th, you're going to get some money back, which is good for you. I, however, have six figures locked up, and that was before July 14th, so that's just how it is. Customers are allowed to withdraw funds, transfer to the platform after the bankruptcy patrician. Uh, the withdrawals will need to be approved by the appointed committee of creditors. And should the transfer amount exceed 40 grand? So... The, the good news is they did greenlight a Flare token airdrop to eligible creditors. Flare, which aims to be a DeFi for XRP, you're going to be able to get that at some point. Celsius itself qualifies to receive 150 million tokens, valued around 0 0.04 cents on Wednesday. So just uh, I would imagine they will be dumping that on the market to pay back things. And that's the goodish ish news. Now, there's a big question which is where should we be going? Where should we be buying? When should we be buying? There's two conflicting camps here. And this right here is Dan Moorhead. And he says, look, Bitcoin's bottom and you should start buying right now. It'll soon make the early gains. He is the CEO of Pantera. And he said a couple of things that were interesting. First, Moorhead compared Bitcoin's 54% drawdown from January 1st to January 17th, 2023 to Tesla, Meta and PayPal stock which all tank slightly more around 60%. I think that's a weird thing to compare it to those stocks, but uh, yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I guess. Blockchain's resilience in the face of a terrible macro market for risk assets and historic idiosyncratic disasters is impressive. And I have to agree with them there. It is. I'm surprised how many people have held on with diamond hands. I believe that Bitcoin is already bottom and we'll see blockchain assets continue their 13 year, 2.3X per year appreciation trend soon. So basically saying buy now. Now, that part's interesting. This part is even more interesting. Bitcoin bottom or not, DeFi can lead the next crypto cycle. This is from, there's a scenario where people will offer DeFi and apps. And it's say that the average person will have apps on their phone that give them access to DeFi, where they'll be able to engage in financial transactions without banks, brokers, lower fees, global liquidity, and no centralized exchanges. And markets are operating 24-7. The internet, but for finance, however, to do that, more institutional capital needs to come into DeFi. And this is why I'm always harping on just a little regulation and just to get some clarity so we can have this institutional capital so people can get access to it. For them to go through DeFi, there's going to be some kind of make or take or volume uh, on the other side. So we need to have a little bit more liquidity in here. But I think it is the future. And I think it could be big. So that is just the first part what Dan Moorhead talks about. And here's the second, Raul Pal, love him or hate him. He's got a great, he's got some opinions. And he says, look, he goes, you need to wait before March, 2023. Now this could be a grifter type of uh, assessment, but some of it makes sense. And he says this, it boils all down to this. Powell believes that we are nearing the bottom of the sell-offs in crypto, three areas that come to his conclusion, rates of change in interest rates, rates of change in the dollar, rates of change in the commodity prices. The narrative you will see is that macro is about to be terrible, so all assets must fall. Look for the turn in the next six months. Central bank will say unemployment is coming up, inflation is coming down. That's when you should have to go in heavy. Here's my assessment. I have no idea. I don't think anybody really has a crystal ball and knows anything what's going on. So what I do is I just dollar cost average. And I will buy every single bottom for Bitcoin. That's the beauty of it because I just dollar cost average every day. 
around $40 or so. I think I actually might uh, increase that a little bit as time goes on, but we'll see how it goes. So again, I don't really care what happens. I just know in the long run, in two, three, four years, probably rewarded. And that's my outlook. So let me actually think about that. And then to finish up, Cardano. Everybody's favorite ghost chain. Nah, nah, don't hate on me yet. This is pretty good. Cardano-based over collateralized stablecoin Jed to launch next week. And if you aren't, I wouldn't, didn't really know what was going on. They actually reached out to me and wanted me to talk about it. And here we go. So, and of course, before we go on, no, they're not giving me any money to talk about this. This is just an article I thought was interesting. Jed will be backed by other tokens and requires more than 400% in collateral value to be posted before it is issued to a user. So this is Cardano's stablecoin. This over collateralized mechanism would allow Jed's value to hold stably during market stress and prevent a repeat of Terra, the infamous stablecoin, which was algorithmic. It's expected to go live on over 40 Cardano-based dApps on launch. The Cardano dApp ecosystem locks up over 72 million worth of tokens as of Wednesday. So I'm just going to link this in the description. I'm going to do something different. Instead of spoon feeding it to you, I'm going to have you make the decision. So this is an explainer video. It's about three minutes long. You can watch that link in the description. This is the Medium article about why uh, Jed should be called an over-collateralized stablecoin and not an algorithmic stablecoin. And you can check those out. Now, as far as like the ghost chain, I say that in jests, look, I have a Cardano stake pool. I believe in Cardano. I think it's going to do great things, but it really comes down to utility. And to talk about that in that light, I'm going to have uh, Mickey Watkins on again from World Mobile Token. And just as far as utility goes, you know, they're already up and running. And they're already running 1.69 terabytes for telecommunications across parts of Africa. And all, guess what? They're coming to America, and guess who's going to have one of those at their sports facility? Who knows? So I will be doing that interview today. I'll release that hopefully tomorrow, and that is it for today. So look, if you like today's video, do me a favor. Give me a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about on this channel is time sensitive. That's it for today. I appreciate you stopping by. I do, and I'll see you on the next one.